I'm playing Wick Mark Martin down there. So. <laughs> Hi, uh, John, would you speak briefly to the question of risk? I know that in western New York, we drilled about 13,000 wells, and the DEC developed the protocol with three layers of steel, three layers of cement. With that 13,000 wells, we've had zero incidences of groundwater contamination. If we go to directional drilling, there would be far fewer well bores needed to produce the same amount of pay or rock formation with gas in it. So if we've had zero instances of contamination with traditional vertical wells, where do we go in terms of risk if we go to directional drilling? Truthfully, it gets it, the risk goes down, but you can't go much lower than zero. The, the, the real risk in any sort of groundwater contamination, everybody knows, the risk comes from here, from us on the surface. I mean, the risk is, is it's, it's mitigated by precautions, by handling, by you know, making sure we're doing things right. Um, we, you know, if, if you take a glass of water and you dump it on this floor, I mean, the biggest hole in this room is up, not down, but the water goes down, okay? So what we have, if we want to understand our risk, we have to understand that it's not going to happen from that, that, you know, what we're doing <coughs> down below it. It's going to happen either from what we're working on the surface or just the time we drill through it. And the industry is progressing dramatically, and even with the stray methane and those things, we know there's natural gas in the surface. I did, I did a job for Syracuse University where they would get natural gas in their geothermal wells at 115 feet in the city of Syracuse. So we know there's natural gas everywhere in the shallow geology of New York. What we as an industry have to do is we have to understand, look, we want to be able to get through it, okay, and make sure it doesn't go anywhere else, okay? And make sure it doesn't cause any problems. That's not always the easiest thing to do, but we're getting better and better and better at it. And and I, you know, now I mean we're do, we're doing things like we're we're drilling with completely balanced environments through the water. We're drilling with freshwater drilling muds. We're drilling, you know, we're just everything we're doing is focused more and more on zero incidents of anything. That's what we're going for. So when you, when you talk about this, I mean, our goal is zero of anything. John, uh, Halliburton's come out saying got a frac fluid that's totally non-toxic. What do you know about that? They do. I mean, they, they, they have some materials that, 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 uh, that are, are essentially green, but let me, I'm going to make, I'm going to make a statement that everybody in this room is going to get mad at me. Because if you, do, if you understand toxicity and you understand chemicals, air is toxic, water is toxic. Those things, too much of anything in the wrong place will kill you. Halliburton has taken, and most of the, most of the simulation companies are taking their chemical products and they're going to the green side basically food grade material. If you went to a shallow oil well frack job in Pennsylvania, okay, and you grab a bag of gel, and you read the bottom of it, it says in big bold letters, food grade material. That doesn't necessarily say, if you ate that entire bag of gel, I guarantee you'd die, okay? But what they're saying is we're using materials that when used properly in a mixture and an exposure that's not meant to impact, because remember, we're working to try to work underground. That's where we want our impact to be. So when we make the mixtures and we handle the product, we minimize the exposure at the surface. And when, when you have a pump truck and what's called a blender, the blender is mixing the materials. That, the, the, the materials that are basically mixed and, and creating that frac fluid it's only mixed for a short area, totally encased in pipe, very close to the well board. So that mixture is hardly exposed, and that's what the industry is working on. So how do you, there's, there's all, I mean, one of the things with 
fracturing treatments when we talked about the problems. <coughs> Every one of those things is used for a specific reason. Okay? When they, some people, you know, it's sort of like when they refer to hydraulic fracturing as a drilling process. It's not a drilling process, it's the completion process. But it all gets sort of lumped together. Fracturing fluid is the combination of all those things, but the general carrying agent of guar gums or things like that, or, or maybe the, the material we use to decrease the friction pressure, that's just a component of it. And each of those components is headed toward the green scale. And here's the next question. Explain to me in layman's terms, fracturing, hydraulic fracturing, using water or <coughs> air to fracture the shale? I, I had the question. I, I had the question in a previous meeting. Somebody asked me about gas frac, which is using propane. And and over my history in hydraulic fracturing, we've used everything from carbon dioxide to nitrogen to foams to diesel fuel to crude oil to propane to water to gel waters. To, I mean, each one of those materials. This business is a science. Each one of those materials is designed for a specific purpose. In completing the rocks we're completing in the Marcellus, and some in the Utica, these are very, very old dry rocks. What we found to date, and I'm not saying this isn't changing because this industry is looking for better every single day. To date, the, the best treatment, the best reaction, the lowest pumping pressures, the lowest friction pressures we've had is utilizing just a slick water. And the slick is the term that was created because we add a friction reducer. All we're trying to do is minimize the back pressure that that pumping is applying to the equipment we have at the surface. So How many PSIs? Uh, any, anywhere from probably 8,000 to 15,000. Depend, it all depends really on that length. We did, a, we did a fairly shallow, fairly short lateral, and we had, you know, 4,500 PSI at, at 80 barrels per minute. And those are, those in, in today's scheme of things, those are substantial pressures and substantial rates. And that's one of the reasons I explained earlier. It, it's hard to take these deep, long laterals and start using things like, say, nitrogen the gas phase, because the one thing that water gives you from a safety perspective is, is it gives you hydrostatic pressure. It weighs something. It's applying its own pressure on that formation. And it also gives you safety that if something breaks, okay, if, if, a, if a valve breaks or something breaks by accident, it basically disperses and stops. If you have that same thing filled with gas, Okay, then it, it starts to have its own life. So water is a very safe treatment fluid. Uh, any other questions? Hi, John. Uh, I saw a couple of times in the previous presentation and then yours using the figure of uh, 300,000 gallons of water, if I got it right, like per stage. Right. I was down in Pennsylvania and looked at many different well pads, or at the gate anyway, and they had the number of permits, like eight permitted wells, four were drilled, and it had there in big letters, four million gallons per day per well, which that's a whole lot more water than 300,000 gallons. I would ask, how? what would be an average to frack a horizontal well, would it take one day, two days? And part of my thinking is, I mean, last year we had, you know, the beginning stages of a, you know, relatively severe drought here in the east. Out in the Midwest, it got very, very severe. Um, to me, when you're looking at millions upon millions of gallons per well pad, <coughs> fresh water that you're now going to, you know, turn into fracking fluid, um, I can drink water, but I can't drink fracking fluid. Uh, it's not, it, it's not, I was looking for the slide that shows what we use, what we use in, you know, there it is. 
That's just, this is the water we consume in New York, 15 billion gallons a day. We flush our toilets and drink and take shower. Right. That's not the water that flows in New York. So everything, I mean, those numbers sound large, but in the scheme of consumption and flow, those numbers are very small. And, and I, you know, I, I don't, it's someplace in my thing. I have a presentation of, of the amount of water that three inches of all the Great Lakes is, or all the, all the Finger Lakes, if you take three inches of water. And as you know, <coughs> basically the Finger Lakes stay constant. So our atmosphere is draining water out of them every day. And they're not really losing, even during a drought, they very seldom lose that much level. And the interesting part is the overall volume of consumption is now being curtailed by this reuse. So if you have, in an area, the example would be, in an area where you just start out and you're doing the first well, that 4 million gallons a day probably is all coming from a new source. But as you do the frac treatment and get four or five wells, now all of a sudden, you have that 20 to 25 percent, maybe even if it's 10 percent flow back from multiple wells accumulating at the same time as you have the need. So all of a sudden, once the process starts, the need for new fresh water continues to decline, and it becomes a consumption of the used water. And a lot, like I said, a lot of a lot of the water that the industry is focusing on using is that water you can't use for drinking or bathing or anything else. We're, you, we're looking at the gray water outflows from treatment plants. We're looking at the gray water outflows from industrial plants. We're looking at the, the pink water outflows from coal mines and using that fluid. Well, I, I just Actually, to follow up on that, if I could, please. Okay. Because part of my concern is if it is like four million gallons per day, Mm -hmm. That's a lot of truckloads of water being moved from point A to point B. Uh, so you got the wear and tear on the road, you've got the diesel fumes from the trucks, plus just the volume of truck truck traffic. But, but you're not see in I don't know where you are in Pennsylvania, but a lot of a lot of the development is built being built with infrastructure. We're using circular water systems to essentially keep the truck traffic in an area that has minimal impact using the pipelines to get the well the water where we need it and it allows that reuse water to basically circulate around the system so we don't have anywhere near the truck traffic that is expected if you just took everything as though it was onesie twosie you know what i mean so like i can i can tell you that all that water isn't coming by individual trucks and that's how that's been Hi, John. I just wanted to add on to um, what you said about toxicity. Toxicity is dependent on many different factors. One is, one is concentration. The other is the length of exposure, how long the person is exposed to whatever chemical it is. Also the timing, you know, and then also um, the route, whether you drink it, you inhale it, or it goes through your skin. Um, We've talked a lot about groundwater, which is a favorite topic of mine, but um, he alluded to something about air quality. We talk about air emissions and um, particulate matter and the industry's impact on this. We talk about the truck traffic and the generators that are firing up the, um, the pumps on the site. And so there's obviously an issue with air emissions. I've heard that some industries, some companies are switching to utilizing the natural gas itself okay. to um, diminish the impact. Um, what, what does that look like in Pennsylvania on the future of gas development? I mean, it, 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 you know, in the onset, I, I mentioned that one of the things as an industry we're doing is minimizing impact. I mean, he's right. That, I mean, it's always good to have smart people in the audience. So, you know, you know, it makes it easier for me. What, what happens is the industry, Cabot in particular, actually, I think they moved their first natural gas rig in, and, and a lot of companies, uh, some of the service companies, are actually converting their pump trucks and their over the road vehicles to natural gas. So as time evolves, and everybody has to realize, like I showed in that one slide, in the 1970s, we were running short of natural gas. 
So the whole evolution of the technology and everything else is, is now we're getting a comfort level that, hey, we can use this stuff. We're not running out. I mean, I, I worked with Cummins Engines down in Jamestown. They build a, uh, we built a booster compressor for them to supply natural gas to their testing facility because they were building natural gas engines for predominantly school buses. They've expanded that. And, and that seems to be a, a growing use in our industry. And a lot of what they're converting to is we're, we're using, since we have the natural gas available, we're using that to generate electricity. And a lot of the equipment, believe it or not, is, is electric. It used to be diesel over electric, and now it's natural gas over electric. So you end up with a lot quieter, you know, a lot cleaner, a lot easier running equipment. That, that's a very good point. I mean, that's where it's going. Uh, I'm make sure I'll make sure I get to everybody. Um, I just have one question. Um, we're east of here. Um, we're we're going about the different pieces of equipment and everything, but um, is there something that you can, I mean, I appreciate the invitation to come and to hear and learn about, you know, fracturing and everything, but um, I guess, will, will you have um, the, the source of your PowerPoint that we can take home with us? Yeah, we can, we can put together some of this stuff and provide it. I, I think, you know, the interesting part about the trips to Pennsylvania and the getting the information is people go there specifically to find it. And I think you heard from Tim, if, if you're not going there to find a drill rig, <laughs> going there to see a frack crew, I mean, you may see some of the truck traffic, okay? But you probably won't even see the rig. I mean, I, 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 my, my mother-in-law lives in New Jersey, so I drive up and down 81 a lot, and I always want to see a drill rig. So, you know, luckily there's been a couple close enough to see them off the you know, off the road, because I want to point them out to the kids. They don't like me to take them out in the mountains to show them a drilling rig. You know, they want to see them from the back seat of the car driving down the highway. And that, that does, you know, it's interesting, but that doesn't happen all that much in an area that's been extensively drilled. Um, a, a quick note, if anybody wants copies of the presentation, the beautiful young lady and the good-looking young man back there, if you leave them your uh, email address, we'll make sure that we, we get it to you. Thank you. And I'll you guys as soon as I can make my way this way. John, I have a better idea. Why don't you give this presentation, maybe in a film or whatever, to the legislator, to the officials, and maybe to Mr. Como, whoever. You, you think they're going to listen to this? Well, no, they have to listen to this because they're our employees, and we demand it let me, as let me, citizens. Let me, let me say something that dri drives me nuts, okay? And, and, and those who know me and let it be understand I'm in a lawsuit with the town of Avon, the town of Caledonia created the same law. I want to tell you something. I've operated in Avon and Caledonia for 30 years. 30 years we drilled wells. And you know what? They had town board meetings. They voted in laws. And, and if somebody came to me and said, we're going to have problems with oil and gas development, the first thing I'd do is call up somebody, especially an operator in a town. I never once got a phone call. The only town that called me was the town of York, and they're the only town that voted it down. <laughs> and the interesting part is, now, you know, after the fact, everybody tells me, well, it doesn't affect you. It doesn't affect you. You can still do what you've done. I said, well, how the hell do you know what I did? You never asked. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, and trust me, the, the moratoriums won't allow me to do what I've done. But the thing is that, you know, what's going on right around us is people, they don't, they don't want to hear. I mean, listen, Ma I almost said Mario Cuomo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Andrew, the same, no, I, 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 I met the father, the yeah, son yeah, I haven't met. But, you know, here, here's an instance where a guy says the industry has to get out there and, and, and teach more and do more. I mean, look at that. He's got a whole SUNY system. I went to a couple of SUNY schools, and the only thing I saw there were anti-presentations. 
I mean, there's, there's something wrong with the educational process if we don't look at it to learn something. I don't, have, I don't have a problem with somebody telling me I'm wrong or somebody correcting me or somebody saying you can do this better. But we're never going to get down the road if we don't talk about it and get it done. This kick, in the, this kick in the barrel that we're doing now is a joke. Four years to discuss something that's basically taken off. And, and, and I'll tell you what. A health study, I'll give you the John Holko health study. Here's the health study. <laughs> wealth, wealth creates health. If you don't have economic value, you don't have a life. And we, it's presented around the world. Look at the third world countries. For God's sakes, most of them have bad health issues because they don't have any money. They don't have clean water because they can't drill it. Brad Vickers from Farm Barrel. Um, I want to thank you for coming down here and um, also I hope everybody uh, saw John Stossel as an investigative reporter and his references on fracking and the silly people. Uh, thank goodness he didn't call them environmentalists. Um, just referencing your water consumption, um, you, know, you probably mentioned it earlier, the SRBC, Susquehanna River Basin Commission, is the one that permits water usage. So, for those that are really concerned about that, uh, the uh, industry can't go out and just draw water from anywhere and use how much they want. Uh, the other references in your numbers, uh, New York City uses that three million in five minutes. Five minutes. An average golf course uses a million gallons of water a day. So, you know, in our perspective, when we're drawing a glass of water, we don't think in millions. But in reality, um, we use a lot of water in New York State. Thank you. I'll get to everybody. <laughs> One of the interesting things that you didn't mention there is that most of that 1.5 billion is, uh, or 15 billion, I guess, is surface water. It's not groundwater. I heard a question about the impact on health from diesel engines. And I can't help but be struck with the lack of conversation relative to the overall net health benefits to New Yorkers by switching from coal to natural gas and the generation of electricity. New York State gets its air from the West, especially Ohio. And Ohio is notoriously bad when it comes to its coal burning plants. So the if we switch to natural gas, and there's already a plan under, or a change underway in western New York with NRG energy switching from coal to natural gas, the net impact on the air quality in New York will be improved immensely. And that will benefit not the 10 people that might be near a diesel truck, but the millions of people that live in New York State. And we just have not had that dialogue. And your comment about, you know, we shouldn't be talking about being for or against, we should be talking about how. How can this be done in a way that protects the quality of the environment and at the same time provides some economic benefit? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. I mean, some, I was in a meeting and somebody talked about that exact issue and they talked about the, uh, the acid rain and the issues in the Adirondacks. And a lot of that is blamed on the, you know, the air quality coming from the West. We have our disposal wells are down at a place called Bear Lake, which has a big swamp. And the swamp was developed because there, was, there used to be a sulfur mine there. So the, the water in the swamp's fairly poor quality anyways. And somebody said, well, you know, all this gas development's going to kill us. And one of the guys in the audience stood up and he says, no, it's not. He says, believe, believe it or not, he said, shutting down all those coal-fired power plants in Ohio and running them on natural gas will make the quality of water in that swamp better than anything anybody else can do. And, and you know, those are the, that's the overall simple things that we miss. Hey John, uh, myself and Dave Parker went up to a neighbor of yours, uh, Saltwater Solutions. Uh -huh. uh, are you familiar with them? Yep. Or, yeah. Uh, could you, uh, I mean, they were truly interesting. They were taking 300 parts per, 300,000 parts per million and distilling it down to 40 parts per million in uh, flowback water. Uh, do you know, could you say a few things about them? Well, they, they, 
Saltwater Solutions was developed. That, that all came out of uh, the issue at the Ritzhoff salt mine. Okay, when, when the mine collapsed, somebody ended up saying, hey, we've got to try to figure out how to keep the fluid level in the mine at, a, at a basically a safe level. So what they've done is they've drilled a couple of Marcellus wells. And they're drawing all the fluid out of the Marcellus wells to maintain a current, you know, sort of a, a basic fluid level in the mine. And in doing that, they're using various methods. They're making, uh, well, God, they're making, they're making rock salt for rock salt for roads. They're making fruit. They're making water softeners for water softeners. They're making horse feed. They're, I mean, they end up with a lot of byproducts. And, and that's, you know, that's sort of what I mentioned in the beginning with our industry. Everybody talks about, oh, there's all these heavy metals and all these problems. There are heavy metals, but. We need those heavy metals in other industrial practices in this world. If we can get them as a byproduct of, of developing, you know, cheap, clean, natural gas, we're just doing that much better. And I mean, it, it's a it's a process that, you know, once you understand what's there and somebody sees the opportunity, I mean, it'll happen. Oh, in New York? Well, New York has to start on the other side allowing the industry to move, so. I just want to make a comment about truck traffic. This is a industrial process. So regardless of how efficient we make it, there will be increased truck traffic. 20 years ago, when I come up to the rural areas, I constantly get stuck behind trucks. It gets stuck behind tractors. Okay, this place was booming. We had an economy here, so there were trucks on the road. But today, I rarely see a truck, particularly by my house. I see a couple coming up each day. That's it. I want to see more trucks. <laughs> When I see a truck <coughs> coming down the road, I know it's someone making a living to support the family. And behind every truck, you know there will be 10 other people working. Let's see more trucks. <laughs> John, did I understand, um, the, the, is it the geology in our area of New York State? that uh, results in a preferential um, uh, fracture direction as you go up. In other words, it's preferentially vertical the deeper you get and then it starts curving, and then it turns into a pancake on the surface. So that's the natural stop gap to, uh, uh, to fluid movement. That's, that's, the, that's the laws of physics. That's right. essentially, essentially, fractures grow perpendicular to least surfaces. <coughs> And that's, that's what happens. The deeper you go, what happens is since the fracture goes this way because the stress becomes this way. Up top, the stress is this way, so the fracture goes this way. So well, it's natural. That, that argument should be shouted from the rooftop. We should all be using that, that logical bit of physics. Oh, no. Right? But, uh, it's not, you know, I'm glad you said that. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to talk about pancakes. Um, I have the same visual that you have. Uh, I was given a word meeting the other night, so this is the, you know, the only second time I've seen it. Um, in the town of Oneana, a lot of the uh, Marcellus Shale is at, from my understanding, at the 2,000 uh, foot level. Mm -hmm. um, and the water table is uh, well, there's one spot where it's a thousand feet down, but most of it's in like the 700 foot, five to 700 foot range. And I was just was curious, um, according to what I was given, it said that the fracks, uh, the fractures can go up to 1500 feet uh, on either side of the, the drill spot, um, if I understand it correctly. Um, so does that mean that it can be introduced into the water table? No. Or, okay. No, because that, 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 the, the, the science behind this 
okay, dictates the fracture growth. When it doesn't, when you only have 2,000 foot of overburden, your fractures don't grow this way. They don't grow that way. I mean, I can take you to a thousand wells I've been on in Pennsylvania that, like I said, we're literally frac hydraulically fracturing four feet apart, and they don't communicate in four feet. How could they grow 1,500 feet? It doesn't. doesn't do that. Okay. Okay. Normal vertical is only about 1,500 feet. It's not 1,500. Normal vertical what? Frac. Uh, or, uh, it, at, yeah, it, at, well, it, it, he's, look, he's looking at this presentation, yeah. which oh, is, the, this, is right. this presentation is a maximum fracture growth off the well bore. And you see <laughs> how here, when the, well, when the vertical is 8,000 feet, you can have some more growth. As it gets up shallower, it gets less. Bring this up here to a couple thousand feet, and it's going to be nothing. It's already showing you between the depths of 8,000 at 8,500 and the depth of 5,500, how much shallower the fracture growth is. They're drilling wells in, in uh, the Bakken out west. They're, they're hydraulically fracturing. They're drilling well bores to have 300 foot center. So they're drilling them 600 foot apart so that they can essentially fracture that 300 feet to recover from each of those well bores because they can't get any further. John, I have a couple of very elementary questions. One of them is, what is the timeline from the start of a drilling process until such time that a, a well produces and goes into a pumping facility? I, I'm going to call somebody else's slideshow up here for a second. Because I'm just going to throw this in mind. This was a presentation Greg Service did. And he has a timeline for what else? <coughs> Bear with me. I got so much stuff on this computer. It all the, it, 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 it's, not, it's not an easy answer because part of it is it depends if you're in sort of the, the exploration side of a play uh, or if you're, if you're in the development side of the play. See, his even, they even move fancier than mine. But this, this is sort of, I, I don't know if you can see this, this is sort of the timeline of, you know, the whole development. And you're starting with about, about you know, three to five years of, of this type of work. And then you're going into, you know, 12 to 18 months of planning and permitting. Two, two months, essentially, in well construction. Three to five days in the hydraulic fracturing. The production period, 20 to 30 years and then reclamation and, and remediation. <clears throat> and I think that that's a good, that's, that's sort of a good presentation of the entire, you know. Well, thank you. Uh, if, if you could share that with us, I think it would be helpful, at least for the time. It's, it's an API slide. I don't know if those guys oh, will be able to share it. Yeah. The, second, the second partial portion of it is the economic impact that would be translated into the per capita or a thousand inhabitants of a of a, a town unit that this would bring about. Is there an average figure that you can assign? If, if, no, I can tell you this: that the industry is working on a better presentable number. There are all kinds of numbers that have impacts. You look at. You look at Cabot's operation in Susquehanna County, they paid over a billion dollars in royalties. Those are royalties. Those are cash payments to landowners. And, and, and people, you know, when, when you get economists that look at economic impact, 
the best dollar you could get is in Joe Smith's pocket because that dollar spreads tremendously. If you build a yogurt plant in Batavia that's owned by a company in Sweden and you give them $25 million, it doesn't impact anybody in Batavia. It helps the guy in Sweden. Right. Right. But, if you pay, but if you pay a royalty to Jim in Batavia, he'll go and buy a new car and he'll go to the restaurant and he'll go to his church and he'll donate some money. And the, impact, the, the social and economic impact is huge. I mean, it just did. So that's something I can't, there's no simple answer, but we are working. I understand. It's just an aberration at this point to put out a number of 11.9 billion that people don't understand. Well, they have, that study does have some detail behind that number. It does. And, and I, I, maybe what I'll do is, is I'll, I've never shown this late same slide presentation twice, so except for today, once this morning, once not. Maybe I'll add that. I can dig that out now. Thank you, John. Uh, Karen Sullivan with the County Planning Department. I've never in my years of planning seen such a diversified issue. And I lis I've listened to both sides. And my question is to you, what is it going to take for New York State to possibly come to a consensus? <laughs> Not as in New York State, but actually at Sego County. <laughs> Secondly, um, <laughs> and where do you see New York State in five years regarding gas drilling? How fast can we I, I, I can I can give you the John Holko interpretation. And now you know now you're not now you're hearing from me. I mean this isn't you know any industry position or anything. But I've been around the only the worst thing that happened to this issue is it became 50-50. Because New York is a politically motivated state, and no one can ever make a decision on a 50-50 issue. So what has to happen, and I've said this, we, get, we need to change the discussion in New York, not from hydraulic fracturing, not from horizontal drilling. We need to talk about energy. New York State is a huge, huge, huge energy consumer. Anybody, I mean, now there's a program out there of turning New York green by 2030. Yeah. I mean, see that? look, I, 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 would, I would love to be able to do it, but I just told you, it would take 40 years of doubling the current development of what we've been developing just to cut the nuclear power in half. For God's sakes, we will never get to cut the others. It ain't going to happen. What people have to realize, what we have to say is, look, okay, Let's not argue about fracking or anything else. Let's talk about energy. Where do you guys want to get it? If you want to get it from wind and solar, then let's start spending the money. I don't have any problem with that. Let's do it. Make the decision. If you want your lights to go out at night when the sun goes down, then that's fine. <laughs> I usually turn mine on at night, so that'd be an issue. But that doesn't matter. I mean, those are the kind of things that we have to talk about. It's not a... It's not, a, this isn't about hydraulic fracture. They made it about that, okay? And now, those, those who are, are against us or, or support the industry, the argument against what we do, the development of natural gas as an energy source, evolves to the next argument that they can create that us in the industry have to prove against. We're, I mean, we actually are now fighting to prove that methane's cleaner than coal. I spent an entire lifetime in Pennsylvania. I went to Penn State. They have one of the largest coal institutes in the country. And I can I can get, I don't know, 500 engineers I know that they would never say that. But we're fighting. Because it's a, you know, now somebody says it's a dramatic greenhouse emissions gas. And if, if that was, you know, like, Tim mentioned, you know, methane isn't considered an issue unless it's in explosive levels. I mean, we, we as humans emit methane. I don't know if you know that or not. We try not to, but sometimes it sticks out. Yeah. Uh, somebody asked a question about the economic impact. Um, I think that Susquehanna County, Pennsylvania, last year, there was, what, $230 million in royalties paid. 
Under New York State's one year. That's one year, correct. Under New York State's tax system, the taxing entities within the county would receive roughly one to one and a half times that amount in property taxes because we calculated that over in Shenango County. And the final comment I'll make about New York State is if we would take an active role um, in educating the workforce here, there would be even more economic impact from this industry. If you go to Pennsylvania, you've got the Shale Gas Institute, um, the Community College in Mount Rose, Pennsylvania is teaching a two-year associate's degree program in natural gas development. Um, we saw some economic impact in Shenango County by actually going out and creating a list of uh, contractors that could work for the industry, which Norse used. So, you know, the economic impact, it, it also somewhat depends on how active you want to be in maximizing that. Hi, this is a positive, um, a positive statement the other day. I don't know how many people have gotten this, uh, this um, on the internet, but of course I don't go anywhere without my iPad here. But uh, from Highworth and Ingrafia, who are the uh, saints of the um, environmental group, um, they came up with a plan, as John mentioned a few minutes ago, on how to meet New York State's power uh, by 2030. And the, that what they want to do, if you don't mind, I'll give you, just give me two seconds on this. They would like to have a conversion by 2030 of 4,000 onshore 5 megawatt wind turbines, 12,770 offshore 5 megawatt wind turbines, 387 100 megawatt concentrated solar plants, 828 50-megawatt photovoltaic power plants. Now, this is what I really like, this one. 5 million, 5 million, 5-kilowatt five residential rooftop photovoltaic systems. And, well, that's, well, they don't mention that. And this, this one I like, too, because everyone who's in business, this will kill you. Uh, 500,000 100-kilowatt commercial government rooftop system. 36 100 megawatt geothermal plants, 1,910 7.75 megawatt wave devices, 2,600 1 megawatt tidal wind turbines, and 7 1,300 megawatt hydroelectric power plants. Now, figure that one out and what taxpayers are going to pay for that. I'm going to have one more. I'm sorry, I'm going to have one more question because I know that John and Tim have to get on the road. And we'll leave it to Mr. Lee since I saw him saying, God bless America. I want to make a commentary on this particular proposal. When you add it all up, it is 600 billion big ones which is five times our annual total New York State budget. Okay, which is totally, forget it, okay? <clears throat> if we spend that money, our people will have no food to eat. That's what the problem is. But that is not the real issue. The real issue is, what they conveniently forget is that all these solar panels are made in China. Why is it made in China? Because it's too expensive to clean it up here. Over in China, they produce the polysilicon, and they do not, do not do anything to remove the tetrachloride, that is the poison that's left behind. In order to remove that, they will have to spend four times the energy which they don't have. So what do they do? They dump it in the villages, they bury it in the ground, they poison the groundwater, and is that what they want? We don't see it here, but we are poisoning the other world. It is the same planet. The issue we 
have in this country is it's not in my backyard. And that's the issue. It's always been an issue. I'd like to thank everybody for coming. I'd like to thank Tim and John for giving the presentation. Uh, they'll be around as long as they can stay if you have any other questions. And if you need any of the presentations, please let us uh, give us your uh, email addresses. We'll get them to you.